From the Embassy Suites by Hilton, Norman Hotel and Conference Center, welcome to the 96th Annual Oklahoma Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. Tonight, we celebrate the lives and accomplishments of eight extraordinary Oklahomans with our state's single highest honor, induction to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. The 2023 Oklahoma Hall of Fame honorees are Dwight Adams, Chairman Rocky Barrett, Judith James, Bill Lance, Jay Mays, Madeline Manning Mims, Barry Pollard, Mary Golda Ross. And now, please welcome to the stage, Masters of Ceremonies for the evening, and members of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, Dr. Pamela McCauley and Sharon Jester Turney. Thank you, thank you. I can speak for Sharon as well as me when I say we are thrilled to be here and to serve as your MCs for the 96th Annual Oklahoma Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. And we certainly are, and you guys look fantastic. Yes, it is hard to imagine, but in 1928, the first class of honorees received Oklahoma's highest honor We've come a long way since then, and now, nearly 100 years later, we're the only state to celebrate our state best and brightest like we do. Go Oklahoma. And <laughs> yes, we can show Oklahoma some love. <laughs> do you remember the night of your induction? I do. I was so excited, yet I was nervous. I was surrounded by my family, my friends, and my peers. And to be back home, I mean, it was so special. It was a night I will never forget. And I so much more, it was so much more than I had even anticipated. You know, before induction, you hear about it from some of the other inductees right. and kind of what to expect. Mm -hmm. But until you are here in this room and under these yes. lights, you can't comprehend the magnitude of this honor. So true. There is no greater reward than being recognized by your own. And tonight, the men and women at the class of 2023 are getting ready to share in that same experience. Awesome. But first, providing the music this evening, and they are fabulous, the they Oklahoma are. Hall of Fame Orchestra under the direction of Jeff Kidwell. Awesome. Awesome. Outstanding. <laughs> yes, they are awesome. And now on to more awesomeness. And now we want to introduce a lot native and fifth generation Oklahoman. She's been shaping state and federal policy, strengthening civic engagement, and serves as a mayoral appointee to the Oklahoma City Maps for Clara Looper Civil Rights Center Committee. And on Sunday mornings, you can hear her singing praises at Fifth Street Baptist Church in downtown Oklahoma City. Please welcome Bailey Perkins Wright to perform the national anthem. <laughs> Nights 
than a black was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner Thank you so much, Bailey, and that was beautiful. And we will hear more from her a little bit later in tonight's show. And now what we are all here for is to recognize and celebrate tonight's honorees, so let's get started. Our first presenter is a native of Bristol. He's a pre president mentress of the University of Central Oklahoma and an Oklahoma Law Enforcement Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. W. Roger Webb. Good evening, everyone. It is a special privilege for me tonight to introduce Dr. Dwight Adams who was born and raised in Edmond, Oklahoma, a graduate of Edmond Memorial and the University of Central Oklahoma. Then he went on to the University of Oklahoma and he received a PhD in biology. In 1983, Dwight Adams had a significant career decision to make. He had to choose between continuing his job as a clerk at 7-Eleven or join the FBI. Thankfully, he made the right choice. Not long after he arrived in Quantico, his talents and skills were recognized, and he was selected as to be a part of a special small team of scientists that he led in the development of a protocol to develop the process of using DNA evidence connected, collected at a crime scene in a criminal case. Dwight Adams was the special witness of the FBI. And he, um, he, he used his skills to uh, be a part of some major cases that came before the FBI. He, uh, he was involved in the Unabomber case, the uh, shoe bomber case, the Murrah bombing case, the O.J. Simpson case, and many others. When it came time to select a forensic science director of our new forensic science institute at UCO, Dwight Adams was the dream candidate. The only problem was he had a job, and a good job, and he was successful at it. He was director of the crime lab in Quantico, Virginia the largest crime lab in the world. There he supervised over 700 scientists and analysts and agents. So when I approached him about, how about coming back to Oklahoma and starting up our forensic science program at UCO, he politely said, well, thank you very much, but we're busy here, we have a good job to do. Renee and I have two children that are still in high school and I'm not quite ready to retire. Because he was the person to make this school work. My response was, well, we understand, and we might just be able to hold off starting our program at UCO until you've had time to finish your job here. And he did, we waited two years. But all the, the, the time that we were waiting for Dwight Adams, we were recruiting him to come and he began recruiting a world-class faculty that he assembled at UCO, and they, in turn, have recruited a world-class group of students. Today, there are over 1,000 students. It's 
the largest academic forensic science program in the United States. And last year, it was rated number one. The Regents for Higher Education have approved a doctoral degree at UCO. Everyone is familiar with the famous statute of Lady Justice, where she's holding the, holding the scales, symbolizing equity and fairness in trials. What we might not always notice about that statute is that she's wearing a blindfold. And Lady Justice is not concerned about the names of the parties to the case, not concerned about their ages or race or political party. She's interested in one thing, and that is the truth. Dwight Adams' Oklahoma roots run deep. His paternal family settled in Carter County, and his mother is a Seminole native. The family settled in Edmond when Adams' father transferred to the Metro for work, the same year Adams entered kindergarten. Active in school activities and Boy Scouts, he looked forward to fishing weekends at the Ardmore family farm with his grandfather. During his senior year, he visited Washington, D.C., unaware of the role the city would play in his life. While at the University of Central Oklahoma, he married Renee Robison, his girlfriend since junior high. After earning his undergraduate and graduate degrees from UCO and Illinois State University, respectively, Adams completed the PhD program at the University of Oklahoma and prepared for an academic appointment. Instead, he landed a job at 7-Eleven. Exploring alternate careers to benefit from his doctoral degree, he was accepted as an FBI special agent. After his swearing in, he spent four months training in Quantico, Virginia, before assignments in Memphis, Tennessee, and ultimately back to Washington. At the newly created DNA research team, he was the only agent qualified to perform DNA analysis of evidence and became the first to testify on such in a criminal proceeding. An expert witness in more than 130 trials, including New York City's Central Park jogger attacks, Adams showed the power of DNA to identify the perpetrators and exonerate the innocent. Promoted to senior executive service, he led mass grave excavations in Kosovo and Mexico, directed scientists and agents during the anthrax investigations, was part of the strong FBI presence at the crime scenes following 9-11, and led personnel to Israel to discuss law enforcement's approach to post-blast events. Adams received the highest citation bestowed on a federal government employee, the Presidential Rank Award, and gave President George W. Bush a tour of the largest crime lab in the world at Quantico. After 23 years of service, Adams retired from the FBI, and the Dwight E. Adams Forensic Science Research Award was created in his honor. With a vision to create a world-class program in forensic science education at UCO, Adams was recruited to return home to implement the Forensic Science Institute. For the next 17 years, Adams invested in the next generation and was honored to celebrate the first graduates of the most highly respected institute for forensic science in the United States. You know, I can talk about a lot of the accolades that have been thrown my way in terms of the efforts that I was a part of in the FBI or the efforts that I was a part of here in the Forensic Science Institute at the University of Central Oklahoma. And those are all very special to me. But my family is what makes me the most proud. And when I say proud, I, I think the better word is thankful. Thankful for them and their life. With his wife, Renee, he is the father of Lindsay and Matthew. The family grew with the addition of daughter Rayleigh's son and has continued to grow with daughter-in-law Bailey, son-in-law David, and grandchildren Elam and Ariel. Family, the greatest sense of pride for Dr. Dwight E. Adams. Welcome Dwight Adams.
Thank you, President Webb. Uh, to be honored by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame is truly very special, and I want to thank all of those who had input into my nomination. I also want you to know that I never accomplished any of the things mentioned tonight all by myself. I was always a part of a team of very talented and dedicated individuals. That is true for my career in the FBI, and that is true for my career at the University of Central Oklahoma. I want all of my colleagues to know that I share this honor with them. I also want to share this with my family, my family who loved me despite missing many birthdays and anniversaries because the Bureau always came first. David Brimer sums it up best for me in his song, Worthy of It All, as I pay final honor to my source of anything good that has ever come my way. He writes about the Lamb of God, and he says, you are worthy of it all, for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Thank you. Oh, congratulations, Dr. Adams. Thank you for your lifelong commitment of protecting us. Our next presenter is a 26th governor for the great state of Oklahoma and the CEO and managing member of Henry Adams Companies, the Honorable Brad Henry. Wow, what a night. It is my great honor to be with you tonight to present for induction my dear friend, John Rocky Barrett, the esteemed seminal chairman of the great citizen Potawatomi Nation. Chairman Barrett and I have been friends for more than 30 years, going back to the days when I was running for state senate in Shawnee, back in the days when a Democrat could still win. What can I say? <laughs> but over the years, I've been on all sides of Rocky. And believe me, it's much better to be with Rocky than against him. But those experiences afforded me a much deeper insight into this truly talented, courageous, innovative leader of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. Now, I'd venture to say that this is a room and a TV audience out there filled with people who, like me, love Oklahoma. And I'd bet most of you would agree that the incredible talents, culture, and heritage of our indigenous tribal nations make Oklahoma uniquely special. Thank you. In fact, in my estimation, one of the most impactful advancements in our great state has been the growing prosperity, influence, and generosity of our extraordinary sovereign Indian nations, which, <laughs> and this tremendous success is owed largely to Chairman Barrett and his insistence on reinvesting the revenues from the nation's diverse commercial enterprises back into development. Whether it be road and water infrastructure, quality, affordable health care, housing, social services, workforce development, and education programs to train the next generation of employees. Chairman Barrett's motto, don't eat the seed corn, I love that, don't eat the seed corn, that motto remains as true today as it did 40 years ago. And the citizen Potawatomi Nation, its employees and citizens, and its neighboring communities continue to benefit from his steadfast devotion to this principle. 
Having served an unprecedented 50 years in tribal elected office, Chairman Rocky Barrett is the living embodiment of public service. His accomplishments are truly remarkable. Chairman Barrett's Potawatomi name is Kiwayoge, meaning he leads them home. And as a result of Chairman Barrett's tireless, almost fanatical work to improve the quality of life for tribal and non-tribal citizens alike, citizen Potawatomi Nation members now have a home for which they are proud. Indeed, Chairman Barrett has led them home. And because of Chairman Barrett, Oklahoma is a more vibrant, prosperous place. His legacy is profound, and his impact will be felt for generations. John A. Barrett, Jr., known as Rocky, was born and raised in Shawnee. He was one of two local delegates selected during his senior year for the three-week United Nations Youth Pilgrimage and pursued higher education at Oklahoma City University. Following in the footsteps of those before him, Barrett was compelled to serve others. As the eighth generation of my family to be uh, tribal chairman, I remember when my, I, my grandmother, is actually my grandmother Peltier was four foot eleven and a little round lady and she could say more by saying nothing than anybody I ever knew and she's one day just she was a few words and she said I think you ought to go out there and fix that the tribe was in some kind of disagreement over nothing and uh, she said I think you ought to go out there and fix that and I said grandma you, you know I'm one of 26 uh, my first cousins, uh, uh, you know, my mother was nine kids, and so we had a big, big family. And I said, you know, I've been involved with the tribe for a long time, and and I've more or less done my duty, and she didn't say anything. And so I kept pressing, and she didn't say anything. So I ran for office. <laughs> so that's really kind of how it happened. Winning the tribal election at the time of his swearing in the citizen Potawatomi Nation had $550 in assets and owned less than three acres of land. Barrett went to work for his fellow members. With the support of his family and fellow leaders, today the nation has more than $800 million in assets and boasts an economic impact of over $550 million. In his 10th term in office, Barrett has guided the nation through tremendous growth while honoring the traditions of his people. His insightful philosophy and deep compassion make him the longest serving chairman in the nation's history. The purchase of First Oklahoma Bank, now Sovereign Bank, opened the door to tremendous economic growth, including the creation of Iron Horse Industrial Park for businesses importing, warehousing, manufacturing, and assembling imported goods. While the joint resolution with the city of Shawnee ensured partnership on projects for the good of the shared communities, a small sampling of the actions to strengthen the nation and as a result, those it serves. Whether welcoming the newest member of the nation, providing a safe place for the children of working parents, or imparting words of wisdom and encouragement on its graduating seniors, Barrett is investing in the next generation he is committed to practicing and passing on the traditions of his people, taking great pride in the customs and origins. Through the establishment of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation Heritage Center, the rich history of the tribe will be preserved. While attending OCU, in 1965, Barrett married Nancy Reese and welcomed his first son, Josh, the following year. Jack followed four years later. Today, with sons Joshua and Jack by his side, he takes pride in celebrating the newest members of the Barrett clan. Family, either blood or tribal, is most revered by Chairman Rocky Barrett. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, a true Oklahoma treasure, Chairman Rocky Barrett. <laughs>
when one receives an honor, a gift or a reward or uh, and some kind of recognition, um, of course, the requirement of good manners is to say thank you. Um, the 38,950 members of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation who've seen fit to elect me 10 times, I'm especially grateful to them or I wouldn't be standing here. So um, in the Potawatomi language, um, uh, there are two different words for thank you. And 40 years of governance does not come without paying a price. And uh, first of all, there are many people that I, I really want to thank, but there are two ways to say thank you in Potawatomi. One is miigwech, which is simply thank you, like you'd thank the postman for delivering the mail or thank someone for uh, a nice meal, that kind of thing. But the other word is igwien. And igwien means thank you from my heart. And it, um, it means your gift or, or your help or your recognition uh, honors me and I will never forget it. Uh, I'm allowed 260 words for my remarks. And I, as for most of you who've known me a long time, 260 words usually doesn't get me warmed up. So I'm, I'm uh, but I, I do want to spread a blanket of Igwein and Miigwech to all of the people here and to everyone here who had a part in my life that enabled me to stand here. And tonight, uh, my Igwein's, uh, again, my most heartfelt thanks goes out to the board of directors of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, especially my good friend, Kathy Laster, for initiating the process that made this night possible for me. Igwe and Kathy for starting that work with uh, Vice Chairman Linda Capps. Vice Chairman Linda Capps is my most precious friend and confident, confidant. I cannot thank her enough for her knowledge and her leadership and her unbending courage and phenomenal work ethic at the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. For over 35 years, she's been a vital member of the executive branch of our tribal government and an inspiration for our entire nation with her work and open-hearted example of leadership. I reserve another Iguian for Dale, D. Wayne Trousdale, our Secretary Treasurer. Um, when I started elective office for the nation, we were not able to recruit our best and brightest because um, we, as the old saying, had neither pot nor window. So, <laughs> um, Thanks to our friend Ross Swimmer, we were able to change our destiny from chaos to progress in 1987 through constitutional change and several others since then. Vice Chairman Capps um, often honors me by telling people I'm a visionary. Actually, I'm a peripheral visionary. I, I can see real far, but it's just way off to the side. And, uh, the other members of our tribal government, uh, our legislature helped to give me a straighter picture. I want and need to say Iguian to my family. My late grandmother, Izetta, Ozetta Izora Bursaw Peltier, who told me to run for office and then ended the conversation. <laughs> and to my sons, Jack and Josh, and their mother, Nancy Barrett, my daughter-in-law, Tiffany Barrett, my grandson, U.S. Navy Petty Officer Third Class, Jackson Barrett, and granddaughters, Kate Barrett and Emmeline Barrett, uh, thank you, Iguian. And I thank God every day for my executive assistant for nearly 30 years, Jamie Mocha, and my oil and gas and registered Angus cattle office manager for over 25 years, Rachel Espo. Without them, you could stick a fork in me because I would be done. So I am honored beyond expression to have uh, the past Oklahoma governor, the Honorable Brad Henry, introduce me tonight. Thank you, Brad and Iguian, governor. And a most heartfelt Iguian also goes out to Chickasaw Nation Governor Bill Anatubby and past Oklahoma Governor the Honorable David Walters for their testimonial letters to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame on my behalf. Governor Walters also signed the very first Class Three compact in Oklahoma history, gaming compact with the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. It's a piece of history that goes back well before the uh, compacts that we have now. And finally, to all of the incredibly talented honorees and my special friends that are 
here to celebrate with me. Thank you, thank you. Iguian Nikonik, thank you, my friends. <laughs> Chairman Rocky Barrett, well deserved and congratulations and thank you from all of our Oklahoma hearts. And presenting Dr. Judith James for induction tonight, please welcome Miss America 1967, former news anchor and leader of the monthly Esther Women Oklahoma Hall of Fame member, Jane Jarrell Gamble. Hello everyone, it is such a joy for me to be able to present Dr. Judith James this evening. Now Judith is an international rock star in the field of scientific research and is considered to be the most respected rheumatologist in the country. Her awards and titles are numerous, most recently being elected to the prestigious National Academy of Medicine the first woman from an Oklahoma institution to receive this honor. Now you can read about her amazing work at Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation and be impressed. You can come to know who she is and be grateful. At the age of four, Judith told her pediatrician that she was going to be a doctor. He encouraged her to be a nurse. But along with her amazing intellect, Judith was gifted with a big dose of persistence and patience. It took her several tries to become a Fleming Scholar at OMRF, where she would spend her career. It was at that time she met two 19-year-old patients in ICU with lupus, the same age as Judith. One eventually became her patient, and the other young woman didn't make it. Well, that experience set the path for Judith toward unraveling the mysteries of autoimmune disease. With deep compassion, Judith was determined to make a difference in the lives of others. And she has certainly done that as a national leader, a scientist, an educator and mentor, a doctor to patients at OMRF, OU Health Sciences Center, the Chickasaw and Cherokee Nations, now, most scientists of Judith's stature did not grow up in a small town like Pond Creek, or graduate with a class of 23, or attend a small Christian university, then attend medical school in the same state. Judith has always known who she is and to whom she belongs. As a result, thousands of lives are better today. She may well be one of the greatest scientists to ever be from Oklahoma. And she has done it her way, grounded in our red dirt, belonging to the land, to the people, and to this place, Oklahoma. She is the Oklahoma story at its best. Judith A. James grew up on the family wheat farm outside of Pond Creek in north central Oklahoma. A fifth generation Oklahoman, she knew from an early age that she wanted to be a doctor. Engaged in a range of extracurricular activities, James was an accomplished organist and pianist in elementary school, a member of 4-H, including induction to the 4-H Grant County Junior Hall of Fame, and cheered on the Panthers at sporting events. Following graduation from Pond Creek Hunter High School, James enrolled at Oklahoma Baptist University. It was the summer following her junior year that she was selected as a Fleming Scholar at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Little did she know then the role OMRF would play in her life. James graduated OBU summa cum laude with honors. Accepted at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, she became the first to complete the MD-PhD program 
graduating with a medical degree and a PhD in microbiology and immunology. While James remained on the Health Sciences Center faculty, she started her independent research lab at OMRF. Blazing a trail from the start, early in her career, she was presented the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the only scientist from an Oklahoma institution to receive the award. She secured the single largest National Institutes of Health grant ever awarded in Oklahoma, led through her Health Sciences Center position for her forging of 29 statewide entities as the Oklahoma Shared Clinical and Translational Resources. In its third renewal, the economic impact exceeds $300 million. For this and other efforts, she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, not only the only woman ever from an Oklahoma institution, but the only current Oklahoman. Worldwide, James presents Oklahoma-based research to provide for a greater understanding of autoimmune diseases, the foundation of her career, and with colleagues, led the first ever lupus prevention trial funded by the NIH. James recognizes that her childhood interests have had a significant impact on her career. I'm a pianist um, and an organist, and I started taking lessons at a very young age. My mother played the piano in the church, and um, I would go and sit at the church um, piano after she would play when I was four or five. Started taking lessons when I was five or six, and really, really was passionate about piano. And I think that piano and math skills tend to go hand in hand, and those math skills go hand in hand with science. I also see music as a creative outlet, and that creative outlet in many ways helps us um, to think about the creative part of science, which is how do you ask new questions and how do you make those new discoveries that are gonna improve patients' lives. Judith James and Glenn Wood were married in Pond Creek in 1994. Just a few years later, they welcomed Becca. The family of three makes time to travel, a favorite pastime. From the Grand Canyon, to riding the ducks in Branson and Disney World. The memories made are treasured. Following in her mother's footsteps, Becca is blazing her own trail as a graduate student at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Although the awards and honors are many and the recognition's great, it is the ability to change and better the lives of others that is the strength and legacy of Judith James. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Judith James. Thank you so much, and thank you for those kind words and the amazing video, but I also have to just say an extra thank you to Jane and to Mrs. Judy Love, both of whom are pushing through some very recent health challenges um, to point out just how tough and tenacious and unstoppable Oklahoma Hall of Fame women are. So as we all know, next week is Thanksgiving, but for me, Thanksgiving came early because I could not be more thankful. Thankful for the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, but also thank you to so many different people. And I have to start with um, thinking about my amazing extended family, my parents, Keith and Ruth James, my brother Reed with Emily, Piper, and Reese. My sister Natalie with Scott and Will and Wes. But especially my husband of almost 30 years and our incredible world-class athlete, biomedical science graduate student daughter, Rebecca. You are so supportive and so appreciated. I also have to thank so many other people, but as Rocky pointed out, we only have 260 words. I have a niece in the audience who's counting them. And so I would, I would love to thank many, many teachers and students, 
I would love to thank many of the colleagues and uh, collaborators. I would also like to thank professors and patients and participants. But the bottom line is uh, that I can't thank them all. And so, I, but I do want to point out what huge, huge roles they've had in my life. So I'd also like to thank two amazing institutions. The first of this would be the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, um, the OMRF, where I've spent over 60% of my life. OMRF has supported our research program, which focuses on understanding, improving, and ideally preventing autoimmune diseases and arthritis. Thank you to the wonderful OMRF leadership and board members and to my incredible research and clinical team, um, trainees and others who are part of our incredible team. Together, we lead national autoimmunity centers of excellence, autoimmune prevention centers, and accelerating medicine partnerships. I also must thank the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, not just for all of my education, but also um, for allowing me to be a faculty member for so many years. Through the creation and national funding of our OSCTR, we've been able to bring together 29 different entities that span the entire state and building amazing partnerships with the Chickasaw and other tribal nations, as well as working with many of our rural communities like where I'm from. And I must thank the tens of thousands of patients and participants who have made that science possible. So from my childhood 4-H motto, to make the best better, to the OCTSI vision, which is to improve the health of all Oklahomans, I thank you for your support of my amazing Oklahoma journey, which is not over yet, and for your commitment in allowing us to pursue the long-standing OMRF motto that more may live longer, healthier lives. Thank you. Wow, how about another round of applause for Dr. Judith James? Wow, amazing, amazing people here, so blessed. For, so, for more than six decades, our next presenter was a journalist for the Oklahoman chronicling current, current events, the work of Oklahoma's nonprofit community, and its social life, Helen Ford Wallace. <laughs> Good evening. I'm thrilled to be here to celebrate one of my favorite Okies, Jay Mays. Jay was my next door neighbor in Maysville, a renowned car designer and artist. He's also a professor of car design at the prestigious Royal College of Art in London. Now living next door in Maysville meant sev several acres over. It was a hike to visit Jay's parents, Joe Francis and Tommy, and Jay's grandparents, Julia and S.J. Mays, who lived two houses away. That was rural Oklahoma in the early 1950s. The town was named Maysville, after the great Mays family, my neighbors. Jay was a baby when I was a teenager, then we moved back to Oklahoma City. But when we went to visit, Jay's parents always brought out stacks and stacks of his artwork. Those car dry drawings were very detailed, major, futurist, futuristic cars with major design lines. He was in the first grade. Jay headed the design teams for a number of the automobile industry's most respected manufacturers. He worked on various concept design while on the job, including the Ford Bronco, Ford 49, Jaguar, Wire F type and the benchmark O21C. During his time at Ford, Jay oversaw 1,200 designers and eight car brands. And after dreaming up cars for more than 60 years, he spent time at Whirlpool, 
dreaming up our everyday appliances, including modern updates of the KitchenAid stand mixer. My, continue, my continued connection to Jay through the years was at the Oklahoman. I was a social columnist, and every time Jay did something famous, the news editors would ask me to find out where he was at the time so they could interview him. And as famous and busy as he was, he always took my calls. Jay Mays was born and raised in Maysville. His fascination with the automobile grew from watching cars pass his father's auto parts store. While in high school, he regularly took his Datsun 240Z drag racing in Ardmore. But design interested Mays more than speed. He enrolled at the University of Oklahoma before transferring to the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California, earning a degree in transportation design. Upon graduation, he already had caught the attention of German automaker Audi. For more than four decades, the kindergartner who spent hours drawing cars has had one of the most, if not the most, successful careers in the history of auto design. His unique intuitiveness to understand the connection we have with our cars has resulted in the creation and reinvention of the most iconic models in automobile history. The new Beetle, the result of May's Concept One, remains one of the most popular cars on the road today. From the Aston Martin DB9 and the Audi TT to the Ford F-150 and Mustang, the creations of Mays are recognized and applauded for their design, technology, and function. And it's not just the cars on the road. When Pixar Studios were shopping designs during the productions of Cars and Zootopia, they consulted Mays. Mays has used his success as a platform to ensure automobile designers are viewed in the same fashion as those that shape buildings and furniture. He has been featured in the most respected industry publications and was the subject of a major exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the first of its kind. Making his home in Great Britain, May's achievements have been the subject of BBC productions and specials, and he's not slowing down. I've still got projects in the fire, uh, so I, I'm, an advisory, I'm on advisory boards for companies various, one of them being uh, Myers Manx, which is a dune buggy company out in California. So I'm out to see them two or three times a year. Uh, I'm still working on uh, animated films that I can't really talk about, but really enjoy that kind of work because it allows my, my fantasy to, to run a little bit wilder than it did in the automotive, automotive industry. So those are the things that keep me busy. And uh, I, I also think that uh, I'm starting to get to the point that um, I, I enjoy teaching, giving back to the next generation. So I'm a tutor at the Royal College of Art here in London, and I go and teach automotive design there uh, a couple of times a month. May's greatest interest, however, is his family, wife Carrie and son Morgan, a graduate of the University of California at Santa Barbara and Loyola Law School. Always willing to lean in to new experiences, it is those shared with Carrie and Morgan that provide the greatest adventure, most treasured of memories, and ultimate reward for Jay Mays. It is my great honor to introduce my friend and someone who never forgot his small town Oklahoma roots, Jay Mays. <laughs> Thanks everyone, gosh that's fantastic. Helen, I am absolutely delighted that you agreed to uh, be here tonight to present me and I can't thank you enough for that. I'd also just like to say before we get started here, an incredible thanks to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. What a marvelous award and uh, thank you for making such a great night possible. Now for something completely different. Um, 
I doubt there are many people here in the audience tonight that will have learned to power slide a car around a corner in the snow when you were nine years old. Uh, I did. Um, keep in mind, I was nine years old, so my legs wouldn't quite reach the pedals. But if you can, picture me wedged between my grandfather, SJ, and the steering wheel of his 63 Oldsmobile Rocket 88. I would steer. Of course, he would control the accelerator. And it was both the best and most terrifying thing that had ever happened to me. Occasionally, out on Highway 19 between Maysville and Lindsay, in exactly that same driving position, we would also have to make sure that the Oldsmobile Rocket 88 would still top out at over 110 miles per hour. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a miracle I'm here tonight. <laughs> My dad uh, owned the local uh, parts store in Maysville, and he taught me about cars after school. My late brother Joe uh, raced go-karts, and then stock cars, and then anything else that would go fast, and I idolized him. And these three men had an outsized influence, not only in my love of automobiles, but some of my most meaningful designs as well. So to this day, I like to think that although the Ford Mustang is made in Detroit, a great big chunk of its soul comes from Maysville, Oklahoma. I feel uh, among the luckiest people in the world tonight. I am the super proud father of Morgan, who's a lawyer in the inter entertainment industry out in LA, and a world-class tennis player to boot. I've got a wonderful relationship with my sister-in-law, Betty, who I say is always the last maze in Maysville. I know she's walking, watching tonight, and Betty, I love you to bits. I'm also a, a super proud of a person that I'd like to try and think properly tonight. And just to say that while I was flying around the world, designing cars and working on movies and generally trying to act like a big shot, my best friend, Carrie, who I also happen to be married to, was running her own brand and communications consultancy back in London, heading up a national uh, poverty charity, and caring for our close friend, Susie, as she slowly lost her battle with cancer. She was also being kind and selfless and patient with her father as he turned 97 and 98 and then 99 and finally 100 before dying this past April. All the while making sure that our relationship and our family was tight as a drum. And in fact, if Carrie had not had my back over the last 20 years, so that I could just simply do the work I love, I would have to tell you, I think it could easily be someone else standing up here tonight. Carrie Stokes, thank you, and I tell you this every day, but you're the one for me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this tremendous honor, and I can't be more proud to be here tonight. Thanks so much. Jay Mays, everyone, what a creative and innovative mind, and congratulations on your inductee. And now it's time for the posthumous induction of our next Oklahoma Hall of Fame honoree, Mary Golda Ross from Park Hill and the Cherokee Nation. Let's learn more about this outstanding Oklahoman. Born to William Wallace Ross Jr. and Mary Henrietta Moore Ross, Mary Golda Ross is the great-great-granddaughter of Principal Chief John Ross. The second of the five Ross children, Curtis, Mary, Billy, Charles, and Robert. She was raised in Park Hill, surrounded by family. She graduated from Tahlequah High School at the age of 16 and earned her degree in mathematics from Northeastern State Teachers College three years later. 
While still taking classes, she began teaching science and mathematics, first at White Oak, then Osage, and finally Barnsdall. During the summers, she began taking graduate courses at Colorado State Teachers College, enjoying every astronomy class offered, and went to work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., before relocating to New Mexico to become the girls' advisor at a school for Pueblo and Navajo children. In 1938, she graduated with her master's degree in mathematics. At the urging of her father, she applied and was hired as a mathematical research assistant at Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. With the United States entering World War II, she played an integral role in correcting a design flaw in the P-38 Lightning before becoming a registered mechanical professional engineer in the state of California. In 1950, Mary Golda Ross became Lockheed's first woman engineer and her career skyrocketed, literally. She was one of 40 engineers and the only woman in Lockheed's top secret Skunk Works program. Her mathematical and practical engineering skills were essential as the company entered the space and missile age. The conceptual stages of the Discoverer space system were in strong position because of her knowledge of space-based hardware. She contributed pioneering analyses for the Mars and Venus flyby missions and assisted NASA in preparing its most notable planetary flight handbook. Her career played out on the pages of Lockheed's internal publications, including advertising distributed worldwide and in newspapers across the United States. She had a following. People of all ages wanted to learn more about her professional career and the personal journey that led her to the pinnacle of a male-dominated field. She even appeared on the popular What's My Line television show. She was named Space Woman of the Year, received the coveted Phoebe Apperson Hearst Gold Medallion Award, the Contributions to Engineering and Scientific Community Award presented by the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, and was inducted to the Silicon Valley Engineering Hall of Fame, among countless other awards and honors. She was one of the first names added to the honor wall overlooking the Potomac at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian. To the ceremony, she wore a Cherokee tear dress, the official tribal dress for women of the Cherokee Nation. Ross's career was one of dedication and dreams. She held memberships in the industry's most prestigious organizations and believed it her duty to be an inspiration for others. Ross lived in Los Altos, California. With an apricot tree in her backyard, she picked, dried, and sulfur roasted the fruit. For years, family members received them as Christmas gifts from Aunt Gold. She was an avid painter and enjoyed celebrating milestones with family and friends. A week before her passing, she was visited by members of her family. She was just shy of 100 years old. I started with a firm foundation and some qualities that came down from my Indian heritage. I had a great deal of curiosity, interest, willingness to study, to do research and to learn, to try out new ideas, and most of all, to work. Lasting words from Mary Golda Ross. Mary Golda Ross, she not only taught us, but showed us that the sky is the limit. We are honored to have members of the Ross family with us tonight to celebrate the induction of their Aunt Gold. Congratulations to each of you. And now, please welcome Pamela back to the stage for tonight's Mission Moment. Thank you, Sharon. Earlier we shared the importance of this night, but there are 364 other days of the year where the Oklahoma Hall of Fame is making a significant impact. From free programming and scholarships to publishing and volunteer leadership, the Hall of Fame is investing in the next generation. And speaking of the next generation, tonight we want to highlight the efforts of the Second Century Board. This dedicated group of young professionals works tirelessly 
to ensure funding for the wide range of programming offered free to students and families statewide. Through their annual fundraiser, Oklahoma Born and Brewed, they are providing a pathway for those that follow. The Oklahoma Hall of Fame's Second Century Board is made up of young professionals from throughout this great state. With unique talents and the desire to serve, every day the Second Century Board is making much needed programming and one-of-a-kind opportunities available to Oklahoma's youth. To date, through their annual fundraiser, they have raised nearly half of a million dollars and ensured the first class event will continue to grow, increasing year over year its level of support. The next generation of state leaders, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame Second Century Board is invested in the future of our great state. We took it from a small event with a relatively you know, small handful of breweries to really appeal to that younger audience of the 20 year olds, the 30 year olds, obviously to bring them in for a fun event, raise money for educational programs, but really to expose that audience to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, the museum here and everything that is offered through the Hall of Fame. I think Born and Brewed is an incredible event. One of my favorite parts about it is that you have this group of young people who believe in Oklahoma. They believe in empowering the next generation. They believe in legacy. As an educator, I see firsthand the impact that the Oklahoma Hall of Fame has on so many students across the state. They're able to connect and learn and find value in those who have walked the Oklahoma land before us and continue to build legacy and culture within our state. That is the reason why I love not only Oklahoma Born and Brew, but just the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in general, is being able to bring in students who probably would have never been able to set foot in this place and learn about their heritage and culture. It's phenomenal. Our next presenter this evening is a former Oklahoma Lieutenant Governor and current president of the University of Central Oklahoma. Please help me welcome President Todd Lamb. Well, good evening. I know that the Hall of Fame Orchestra has already been recognized and introduced but as of note, we're not moonlighting as a Hall of Fame orchestra. They are all musicians at the University of Central Oklahoma. <laughs> Roll chose. Uh, from my time as Lieutenant Governor and that office playing a role in this event, I know well the enormity of tonight's honor. And I know well that Dr. Barry Pollard is worthy of tonight's honor. The Lamb and Pollard families were neighbors in Northwest Oklahoma. The Pollards from Hennessy, if you don't know where that is, that's north of Dover. Uh, and then Wacomus, if you're unfamiliar, that is north of Bison. And Enid, if you don't know where that is, you need to get out more. But growing up, I watched and admired the career of Dr. Pollard. Many, after they leave home to pursue their educational pursuits, they don't go back home. In Oklahoma, they don't go back home too often. But Dr. Pollard was different. He was passionate about returning home. Following the earning of his medical degree, he had multiple opportunities for fellowships and jobs all throughout the country at large practices in metropolitan areas. But it was important for Dr. Pollard to return home, home to Northwest Oklahoma, and serve the people there, his people. Patients no longer had to make long trips to receive specialized health care. He has impacted the lives of thousands during his first career, over 20,000 surgeries in Enid, Oklahoma. And to put that further in perspective, 
Before Dr. Pollard, there was no neurosurgeon in Northwest Oklahoma. And since his retirement, there is no neurosurgeon in Northwest Oklahoma, his first career. Then there's P&K equipment. Dr. Pollard started by purchasing the John Deere dealership in Kingfisher where he traded the store he did his personal business as a farmer and rancher. One store. Now through 29 P&K locations, he's providing employment for hundreds and providing fellow farmers with the latest technology so we can all eat. He's a rancher purchasing his first Angus herd in the early 1990s. Today, buyers come from all over the country to the Pollard's annual sales. Dr. Pollard is one of those people that is all in all the time, whether in the operating room, in a combine, or in the sale barn feeding us. You know you're getting an investment from one of Oklahoma's very, very best. Barry Pollard grew up in the rural community of Hennessy. The oldest of six, Pollard was destined to be a cowboy. He was active in 4-H and regularly helped his father work cattle on the family farm. His parents were educators. Father Russell, an OSU alum, was an agriculture teacher, and Mother Patsy taught elementary school. A graduate of Oklahoma State University, where he was a member of Farmhouse Fraternity, he went on to earn a medical degree from the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. With offers to join multiple neurosurgery practices in Oklahoma City, Pollard knew he wanted to live, work, farm, and raise his family in a smaller community. He became the first neurosurgeon in Enid. As a result, for more than 40 years, he provided specialized health care to the residents of Northwest Oklahoma, allowing residents to remain close to home while receiving treatment. In 1985, Pollard purchased his first John Deere dealership. With a deep understanding of and appreciation for reliable farm equipment, today he owns 29 dealerships in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Iowa, and employs more than 800 men and women. P&K Equipment, commonly referred to as Pollard and Kids, has become a family business with Pollard's three sons involved in the leadership team. In 1982, Pollard met and married Roxanne King. A former neurosurgical nurse, she worked alongside Pollard early in his career. The couple make their home on Pollard Farm in rural Wacomus, south of Enid, where Pollard raises registered Angus cattle and serves on the American Angus Association Board of Directors. Pollard believes in the impact of 4-H and FFA and continues to invest in the next generation. I remember from my childhood that whenever we'd have a premium sale where the kids show their animals, and if the animal's good enough or they get to go through a sale and you did a premium, you're not giving up your animal, you're getting a reward for the hard work. And people in the communities, the bankers, the co-op people, uh, people in the businesses in the communities would come, still do to this day, and support kids and by giving premiums to them. Uh, I remember being the recipient of that and uh, Merrill Burris at Kingfisher Bank was the one who gave me the first premium I remember still at the Kingfisher County Fair. Uh, but you know, those are important things for those kids. They've got to have, it's expensive to take care of the animals and buy the feed and take care of them. And you know, to be, be able to get something back to help buy the next animal or take care of the next animal is an important part of that. Um, so the businesses that support those activities are providing an opportunity for our youth to continue to do things that develop them into the kind of people that are responsible and will care for animals, will care for each other, and all those things you learn uh, doing so. So uh, I've been a big part of 4-H, FFA, P&K. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars through the years on premium sales for kids in Oklahoma and in Iowa. In addition to 4-H and FFA, Pollard is a staunch supporter of his alma mater, Oklahoma State University, including making higher education possible for students interested in agriculture. He is a member of the OSU Hall of Fame and the Oklahoma Agriculture Hall of Fame. From the start, 
the value of family was instilled in Pollard and his siblings by their parents. With Roxanne, they have a blended family of six children and 11 grandchildren. It is that same value of family that Pollard instills in his own. With each new birth, celebration, and holiday, the value of family becomes more revered by Barry Pollard. Ladies and gentlemen, a neurosurgeon, an entrepreneur, a farmer and rancher, and a darn good guy, Dr. Barry Pollard. Thank you to everyone, and thank you, Todd, for those kind words. And thank you to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame for the presentation of that snapshot of my life. I am so honored to have been selected. You know, I think most Hall of Fame members are chosen because of their achievements in their lives and their service to their communities. I would like to be remembered for the service that has been provided not only by me, but by my medical staff and by my agriculture staff. They have contributed immensely to any achievements and services that we together have provided. You see, with me, it's never been a me thing. It's always been a team thing. I would, thank, I would also like to thank and recognize my family who's here tonight. My wonderful mother, Patsy, of 94 years, is with us tonight. Thank you, Mom, for being here. My beautiful wife, Roxanne, who stands beside me every day. My sons, Barrett, Austin, and Preston Pollard, and their families. And Jeff and April Keen, Stephanie Stevens, also part of our family. And I would also like to thank all of those who've worked beside me for all these years. My nurse, Regina Krause, is in the audience of 40 years. My lifelong office manager, Linda McElroy, is with me tonight, as well as Scott Eisenhower and Drew Combs, partners of me in PNK Equipment, and many of our staff. I'd also like to recognize members of the Board of Directors of the American Ag Association that serve with me in the back, and a special tribute and thank you to my Oklahoma State family who is here tonight. Thank you. Again, I want to express my gratitude to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame and leave you with this quote that I, has served me well. There has seldom been a time that I could not look back at a day and think that I could not have done more. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is the founder of Impact Fitness, a personal training company serving individuals and elite athletes, including Tulsa's WNBA Shock. Please welcome John Jackson. <laughs> Good evening. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. This particular Bible verse became entrenched in my heart as a child through the example of my mom. Her foundation is rooted in faith, and she has accomplished great things by combining that faith with her talent, hard work, determination, and character. I witnessed an example of her character on a hot afternoon in Catoosa, Oklahoma. This was the state meet, by the way. Mom and I were attending. She enjoys attending these meets as a spectator and has even coached state champions Javon Polk and little sis Lana Mims. But on this day, she was there to watch an athlete I was training. After warming up my athlete, I returned to the bleachers 
to find my mom being instructed on the finer points of running technique, consistency, and mental approach in track and field by gentlemen we didn't recognize. My mom listened intently and respectfully to every word of his track lecture. And at the same moment, she was recognized by someone in the press box. And they announced, good afternoon. We have a very special guest in attendance. She is four-time Olympic gold and silver medalist and former rail record holder in the 800 meters, Madeline Manning Mims. <laughs> Mom stood up and smiled and waved at the elated crowd. The gentleman she'd been speaking with was awestruck and dumbfounded. He said, why didn't you tell me who you were, he asked. She replied, because you were very knowledgeable and I learned a lot. What my mom didn't know was I learned a lot too. In that very moment, she taught me that humility is a blessing and that it is important to know when to be the teacher and when to be the student when to be fed and when to feed, and how we should appreciate others who are God gifted with uh, what God gifted them to be. We should also pursue greatness in ourselves while at the same time recognizing the greatness in others. <laughs> The youngest child of Cecil Sr. and Queen Manning, Madeline Manning Mims was diagnosed with spinal meningitis at the age of three. Her parents were told she would not survive. But Mims had other plans. She had records to set and ceilings to break. In high school, she scored higher than anyone her age on the national fitness test. It was at Tennessee State University, during the height of political unrest and racial tensions, that Mims made the 1968 U.S. Olympic team. In Mexico City, after the opening ceremonies and before the competition, she started to think. I started thinking, what am I going to do? You know, what, how's this gonna turn out? I start questioning myself. Who believes in me? I know my coach that started me, who is here with me, my coach from college, you know, I know they believe in me, but they don't know the outcome. You know, I, I know um, what I think I can do, you know. I, I know I've been the best in the world for the last two years. I don't know exactly how this is going to turn out. I, I said to the Lord, you know what, from here on out, I'm running for Jesus. I'm running for you, Lord. And however this turns out, to you be the glory. And I felt this peace just flood, flood my body and I was just relaxed and ready to go. Mims became the first American woman to win gold in the 800 meter, a record that she would hold for more than 50 years and the first American woman to break the two minute barrier in the 800. She also set Olympic, world and American records and she's been running for Jesus ever since. Her TSU Tiger Bell teammates were witness to Mims opening the global door for women of color in distance running. She earned silver in the 4x400 relay at the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, Germany, where she was awakened in the night by the Munich massacre, the kidnapping and killing of Israeli team members. She participated in the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, Canada, and qualified as a member of the 1980 Olympic team. With the United States boycott of the games in Moscow, Mims had competed in her last Olympics. However, she has played an integral role in the games that followed as chaplain to the U.S. team. With an honorary doctorate of divinity, master's of divinity, and doctorate of ministry from Oral Roberts University, combined with the deep relationship with her Lord and Savior and the need for sharing His Word with others, Mims founded the United States Council for Sports Chaplaincy. She has shared the gospel with athletes around the world. In addition to serving as a sports commentator for NBC Sports, she has played an integral role with Athletes International Ministries, reaching active and retired professional athletes, college athletes, coaches, and other athletic affiliates. With the voice of an angel, Mims has performed at Olympic reunions professional sporting events, conferences, and for Pope John Paul II 
during his visit to the United States. She has worked with heads of state and dignitaries from throughout the world. Her honors include induction to the Black Women's Sports, Olympic, and Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fames, the Century of Champions Award, the President and Mrs. George Bush Community Impact Award, and is featured in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. The proud mother of daughter Lana and son John, Mims and her husband Roderick make their home in Tulsa. Still running for Jesus, spreading his word remains the driving force for Madeline Manning Mims. Ladies and gentlemen, I enthusiastically welcome Dr. Madeline Manning Mims to the 96th class of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. This is such a night for me, and I'm so thankful to be here. One thing that I want to say even before I get moving on it, because they came from across the country, out of the 68, 72, 76, and 80 Olympic Games that I made, some of my teammates are here. <laughs> Some of the greatest legends that represented us are here. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, I first want to give all the glory to God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. And make no bones about it, I'm very thankful to be alive to tell you what he's done in my life. I could not ask for or dream of or even think or imagine of what I would have become had he not intervened for me when I was a little girl. As the Bible says in Psalms 139, verse 14, I will praise him because I am fearfully and wonderfully made and my soul knows it right well. When I look back on where the Lord has brought me from, what he has brought me through, what he has brought me to, all I can say is hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise for all time. Because when I was three years old, my mother was told by the doctors, your little girl has spinal meningitis and she's not going to live. And she told me later when I was older that she prayed and she listened to them. When they went out the door, she said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she, she said, I talked to Dr. Jesus. And I vowed that I would give you back to him if he saved your life for me. And she trained me up in the ways of the Lord, the best way she knew how. She kept her vow, and it's most apparent that God kept his. I thank you for these wonderful honorees tonight. I'm just overwhelmed to be a part of you, to know how much God has done in your life how powerful you are to change states and nations and people's lives as you have. And due to the greatness and faithfulness of God sticking to his promises to us, we can all say, I have come short of his glory, but he has never left me alone. He has never given up on me. And when I was interviewed, I thank God that uh, I was asked this question, what is your legacy that you want to leave with people when you get ready to finish your work? I said, you know, it's wonderful and it's very humbling 
to be a part of such highly esteemed accolades such as tonight's honor. But I want to tell you this. If people cannot see Jesus in me, if they don't know how much I love the Lord and how much he has meant to my life, then all of this is in vain. I live to his glory, to his honor. And I wonder, how is God so mindful of me? A little girl from the ghetto. I want to thank all of the Oklahoma staff that have just been there for me, been through Jenny especially. I love that lady. And to my family, my husband, my children, my friends, my honorees that are here, for all the things that you've meant to me and will always mean to me in my life, I love you so much. And I pray for you that God will continuously bless you. I pray for each one of you and I thank you for honoring us in such a manner as this. For when you honor me, you honor the one who created me in his image and in his likeness. The Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. Thank you. Wow, congratulations to our Oklahoma Olympian again, Dr. Mims. The final presenter tonight is Governor Bill uh, Anatubi of the Chickasaw Nation and a member of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Anna Tooby. Hi, everybody. Isn't this a wonderful ceremony? And the inductees, aren't they? They were so special. Yeah, don't you think? Yeah. Well, I'm honored to present another special person, a proud Chickasaw from Murray County, Bill Lance, for induction into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. He's a true pillar of the Chickasaw Nation and the state of Oklahoma and I'm proud to call him my dear friend and colleague. Throughout our history, the Chickasaw Nation has been fortunate to have exceptional leaders, resilient individuals who have devoted their lives to the betterment of our people. Bill has been a visionary leader who skillfully reimagined and re-engineered our business structure and oversaw the expansion of our Commerce Department into a substantial business enterprise. He has been instrumental in the growth and prosperity of this nation, the Chickasaw Nation, and the state of Oklahoma. He displays unwavering commitment, compassion, and a deep understanding of our cultural heritage and Oklahoma's history. His inspiring leadership has been marked by innovation, bringing groundbreaking initiatives that have transformed the nation's landscape. He has created extraordinary health care, manufacturing, hospitality, gaming and entertainment businesses and enterprises, providing thousands of jobs for Oklahoma. But beyond Bill's professional achievements, I admire his solid character, unbendable integrity, and caring spirit, a shining example to all. He's a master bridge builder, embodying the words, united we thrive. Bill believes in giving back to the community. He demonstrates his drive to create a better future for all through his active involvement in a number, number of nonprofits. Finally, the role a family plays 
in an, in an individual's success cannot be overstated. Bill enjoys the unwavering support of his incredible family, starting with his accomplished wife, Sherry, and his wonderful children, Bryson, Kendall, and Katie. He enjoys teaching his three beautiful granddaughters Chickasaw history and the importance of staying, connect, staying connected to our tribe. A fifth generation Oklahoman and member of the Chickasaw Nation, Bill G. Lance Jr. grew up in Sulphur, the community he still calls home. A standout football player, Lance was named District Player of the Year and to the all-region team before graduating and enrolling at East Central University. With a master's in public health from the University of Oklahoma, Lance was instrumental in securing the funding and overseeing construction of the new Chickasaw Nation Medical Center in Ada. So you know, I had a great conversation with the governor about the joint venture construction program. Um, that's, it's a competitive grant through Indian Health Service. And uh, described to him that if we could get the agency to amend their policy to allow an inpatient facility to apply and compete for that grant, I felt like we had a great chance of winning that grant, but just because of our team and the need in our community, especially our Native American population. And so we started working Congress and started working IHS, and IHS amended those rules to allow an inpatient, a hospital, to apply for that joint venture construction program. First time they had ever amended those rules ever. The state-of-the-art 370,000 square foot health facility opened in August of 2010 and has been serving the community ever since. Lance was the longest serving Secretary of Commerce in Chickasaw Nation history before being named the nation's first Secretary of State. Under his leadership, the nation's annual net income has more than tripled and more than 7,000 jobs have been created through gaming, hospitality, retail, media, manufacturing, and tourism-related businesses. Lance not only represents the nation on community and corporate boards, but lends his talent to regional, statewide, and charitable causes as well. His list of honors and awards is lengthy and includes the East Central University Distinguished Alumnus Award and induction to Oklahoma City University Minder School of Business Commerce and Industry Hall of Honor. From childhood friendships to the most recent, Lance is grateful for the relationships he has been entrusted with. With wife Sherry by his side, as a husband, father, and grandfather, it is family that continues to provide the greatest blessings for Bill Lance. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with immense joy that I can now refer to my dear friend as a fellow inductee into the revered Oklahoma Hall of Fame, the Secretary of State for the Chickasaw Nation, Bill Lance. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Wow, that's just pretty special. Th thank you, Governor Ann Tubby, for that very warm and generous introduction. It's been my honor to serve you and the Chickasaw people for over 25 years. As a Chickasaw citizen, Oklahoman, and proud ambassador for Murray County, I'm incredibly humbled to be recognized alongside Oklahomans who have shaped our state and left an indelible mark on its future. I am awed by this stellar group of inductees. Dwight Adams, my friend Chairman Rocky Barrett, Dr. Judith James, Jay Mays, Madeline Manny Mims, Dr. Barry Pollard, and Mary Golda Ross. My heartfelt congratulations to each of you and your families. Thank you to the Hall of Fame for including me 
in this outstanding class of Oklahomans. I'm blessed to have a wonderful family. Their unwavering support, guidance, wisdom, and enthusiasm have been instrumental in my life. My talented and beautiful wife, Sherry, and daughter, Katie, my sons, Kendall and Bryson, their wives, Erica and Kayla, and my three precious granddaughters, KJ, Quinn, and Sloan. My love for each of you is without comparison. Thank you. My family's roots in Sulphur and Murray County run deep. The spring water has flowed through my family for generations. My mother, Glenda Hamilton, who's here tonight, told me stories of my great-grandmother's love for the healing waters of the Sulphur Springs. Lenore Brown Elmore believed in the powers of the Sulphur Springs, drinking the water daily until she passed in 1960. When Governor Anatubby asked me to escort the mediator over the historic water litigation involving Chickasaw, Choctaw, State of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma City on a tour of the Chickasaw Nation and the Chickasaw Nation Recreational Area, I took the gentleman to Pavilion Springs to join me in drinking the water. But he refused to partake due to the sulfur smell. I told him we have a local saying, if they can't drink the water, don't trust them. <laughs> he ultimately protested, but eventually drank it. And I don't know if you remember that bitter beer face commercial, but that's kind of what he looked like, okay? <laughs> At the end of the day, I think he better understood the strong connection between water and community, and that's really what we were trying to communicate. I'm grateful to be a part of this remarkable community. My induction into the Hall of Fame reflects the enduring spirit of my Chickasaw heritage and my roots in Sulphur, Murray County, and Oklahoma. This honor symbolizes our collective strength and unity transcending individual achievements. I accept this award with a profound sense of humility, recognizing that it represents the spirit of the many people who have helped shape my path. Chukmashki, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, Secretary Lance, and congratulations to all of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame Class of 2023. Let's celebrate them one more time with a round of applause. <laughs> so exciting. And you know, Sharon, to wear one of those beautiful medallions is such a privilege. Right now, after tonight's induction, there have been 738 Oklahomans to receive this amazing honor. And you know, with great honor comes great responsibility. And members, as a member of the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, we're not only expected to set the example and re represent our home state well, mm -hmm. but to never stop charting new courses fighting for what is right and just, and paving the way and providing opportunities for those that follow. Amen, you are so right, Sharon. And now let us lead us, now, I'm sorry, and I'm so excited. And now <laughs> to lead us in the best state song, which I have to say became our state song 70 years ago in 1953. So. We are about to have fun with our state song. Let's welcome Bailey Perkins Wright and the Oklahoma Hall of Fame Class of 2023 to lead us in singing our state song. And we thank you all very much. Thank yes. you for letting us MC, and yes. good night, everyone, from us. Yes, good night. Thank you. Thank you. 